away with, with some important notes. I just wanted to give you a couple things that I thought were important on leadership, not just because I think they're important, but uh, I feel like they're important to you. I'm going to tell you um, a, a, a saying, I guess I could call it a little story, um, of a man, a man who fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. How many of y'all have ever been in a situation where you feel like you've fallen and you do not know how to get out? Maybe that's just me. Okay, praise God. There's some people, maybe some in the back, have lived a good life. So, all right. But that's all right. That's me, though. I know that's me. Maybe it's you too? All right. So a man fell in a pit and he couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there in the pit. An objective person came along and said, it's logical that someone would fall down into this pit. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you are in a pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into the pit. A newspaper reporter wanted the exclusive story on the pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve your pit. Confucius said, if you listen to me, you wouldn't be in that pit. Buddha said, a pit is only your state of mind. A realist said, that's a pit. <laughs> a scientist calculated the necessary pressure to get him out of the pit. A geologist told him to appreciate the rock structure within the pit. A high school student took a picture and posted it on Instagram. Hashtag the struggle. The tax man asked him, if he was paying taxes on the pit. The city inspector asked him if he had permit to dig the pit. An evasive person came along and avoided the subject of the pit altogether. A self-pitying person came along and said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. An optimist said, things could get worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. A charismatic said, just confess, you're not in the pit. But Jesus, seeing the man, knelt down and lifted him up out of the pit. It says in Psalms chapter 42 and verse 2, excuse me, Psalms chapter 40, verse 2 in the New Living Translation, He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and out of the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. What is leadership about? I was meditating on what leadership is about. Leadership is about Helping people out of the pit. What I'm here to do with my gift is the same thing that you're placed on this earth to do with your gift. Help people. That's what God has called all of us to ultimately to serve with our gift. We do it for his glory, not for our glory. We do it to build his kingdom. What is leadership about? Leadership is about helping others out of the pit. Leadership is about people first. How do I know? Because if there was no people to lead, you wouldn't be leading anything. So leadership is about people. If there's nobody following you, then how are you leading? It's impossible to lead without anything following you. When you lead, you're leading people a certain direction. You're always leading people somewhere. You're always leading with something. I'm glad that you all had an opportunity to be equipped and built up through this program because we believe that each and every one of you all are leaders. Not just leaders because I say so, but leaders because God has made you a leader. Now, earlier this week in our BWM devotions, we were having a discussion. Is a leader born or made? The age-old philosophical discussion. A leader's born. Are they made? Are they a product of their environment? Or were they just born genetically that has that inner thing? They just have that clock that ticks, that thing that says, I am going to lead no matter what. 
I believe that all of us have leadership capability and potential. Why? Very simple. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God made man and his image according to his likeness. So if I am made like God, God is a leader, right? We would say Jesus was the leader of all leaders. We have no clue how many people that we study in our history books are mimicking something that Jesus did first. He was the ultimate leader. He wasn't scared to say something that other people wouldn't say. But he always made sure that he kept the goal in mind, leading people towards the kingdom, towards God. He said, I'll only do it if my father has done it. I'll only say it if my father says to say it. I'll only go if my father says to go. In each and every opportunity, we see the woman at the well who uh, had, had five husbands, was on the sixth, but wasn't even married to that one, was living with that one. And Jesus came and he read her mail, but yet he didn't condemn her. He didn't condemn her. He just showed her a better way. A woman who was caught in the midst, in the act of adultery. What did he tell her? He said, your sins are forgiven. You go and sin no more. Bless you. Maybe. (laughs) He said, go and sin no more. Now, the others wanted to stone her. But Jesus had a different response. Why? Because he was about helping people out of the pit. The 12 disciples, were they people who had theological degrees? Maybe people who had gone to the school of ministry, right? Right. Maybe people who were anointed prophets of God. No, he chose none of those. He chose people who are fishermen, tax collectors, had everyday jobs. And how was he able to take these people who were unchurched, who didn't know about religion, who hadn't graduated from the school of theology, how did he take these people and train them up to be some of the greatest apostles that we've ever known? Because he saw his purpose in helping raise people out of the pit. Leadership is about leading people towards Christ. Don't ever forget it. And acting as Christ would act. Now, how am I going to lead people? What am I going to do? What do I need to do? How do, what do I need to say? I believe that one of the biggest keys in leadership is being able to hear God's voice. One of the biggest things that I, I, I discovered, and not that it was a new discovery, but that I learned at Oral Roberts University is I learned the importance of hearing God's voice. Not just hearing God through mom, not just hearing mom through dad, not just hearing mom through grandma, auntie, uncle, and them. But hearing God's voice for myself. Why? Because at the end of the day, everybody has great intentions for me. Mom and dad can be saved and spirit-filled and can lead me in a great direction. But it is the plan of the Lord that will stand. And so at some point, somewhere, I have to have real relationship with him because he ultimately is the only one that can dictate my potential. Why? Because he's the only one that put me on this earth. With the assistance of my parents, of course. (laughs) They had to agree. But he's the dictator of potential. It says in the scripture, and I I won't read the whole passage, but in John chapter 13, We come to the foot washing of Jesus, and this is uh, before he goes to the cross, and he comes to Simon Peter. He's ready to wash Simon Peter's feet, and Simon Peter says, whoa, whoa, Jesus, what are you doing? I'm not worthy that you should wash my feet. As a matter of fact, why don't you sit down, Jesus? Let me wash your feet, because he felt like that was the holier thing. That was the better thing, and you know, in reality, maybe that might have been The better thing, maybe if I was even in that position, I might have suggested the same thing. Jesus, sit down. Let me serve you. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to take this opportunity to show you that if you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you have to be able to learn how to serve, how to become least. I'm not here that you should put me on a pedestal and you should wash my feet. 
I'm here to show you an example that will remain after I go to the cross. How to serve. You know, everybody wants the billion dollar idea. Everybody wants the million dollar business. But who wants the million dollar character? Billion dollar character. Knowing how to serve when nobody else is looking and nobody else cares. You know, I, uh, growing up in the household with my parents, you know, people always ask me questions about my dad. How was, how was growing up with Pastor Winston? What happened? Like, how was he? Was he strict? Could you do stuff? Could you not? So I'm going to give you an inside tip. I'm going to give you a little story. So growing up in the house, I remember my father always used to ask me to do tasks. And, you know, how many of y'all parents ask you to do stuff around the house, right? Okay. And if you don't get asked to do stuff around the house, I'll invite you to my house. You can do stuff around my house. And so my dad would always ask me to do certain tasks around the house, but sometimes there were little things for him, such as, you know, get him a bottle of water or something. Okay, Dad, I got you. Do, 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 do. Give it to him. And I was a pretty laid back kid growing up. And then he would ask me to do other things. He'd sit down on the couch, get real nice and comfortable, ask me to get him the remote. Call me from upstairs. <laughs> David? Come down here and grab this remote for me. Parents remote. Here I come down the stairs. Yes, Dad. What's up? Uh, get this remote right here for me. That one right there? Yeah, this one right here. That one right Okay, okay. Oh, okay. All right, here we go. Good? Yeah, I'm good. Go back upstairs. David! Yes? And then you get that pause. Yes, sir. Uh, close these blinds right here. So what? The blinds. The blinds right here? These? Five feet away, these blinds. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And you know, sometimes these things seem like, why can't you just do it? Oh, am I reading somebody's story? Oh, oh, amen. You know, I was in that same boat. I used to wonder, Dad, why are you having me do this stuff that you can do like in three seconds? That's, it's right there. And I'm like 100 feet away. And you know, I realized a valuable lesson, but it wasn't until I got older. And a lot of y'all, I'm going to blow your mind with a simple statement. Are you ready? Stuff that you're learning now isn't useless. Wait 10 years. Just wait. For some of y'all, it might be five. For some of y'all, it might be three. Just wait. Grown man, I'm 30 years old now. And I'm like, man, they kind of knew what they was talking about sometimes. Man. It's like, now you get older, you willingly call and ask them for advice. Like, man, you, what was you saying that one time? Remember this happened? And what was you saying? You know, I'm dealing with this situation right now. Really want some advice. So, okay, so my point is, They were training me. I thank my dad because he was training me on a principle that was so important to Jesus that it was one of the last messages, one of the last sermons that he gave his disciples before he left. Serve. That's deep, right? One word, serve. And he trained me on how to serve with humility. And I might have not understood it at that point, and he might not even thought it was that deep, but God had a plan even for those mundane tasks that I thought could be a waste of time. It was training me inside. It was building something that I've heard my mom talk about 10,000 times. She would say, David, it's building character. It's building character. It's building character. I couldn't get to where I am now if that character foundation was not built. Everything that you're going through, what you've been through this summer, 
And what yet you have to experience onward is building a platform and a foundation for your success. Who in their right mind builds the tallest skyscraper in the world on a foundation of plain sand? Nobody. You know why? Because it won't stand. Because when the waves come, things come against it, winds come, it's just going to fall. Why? Because the foundation was never prepared. Now, sometimes when you're building those tall buildings, it'll take years and years and years, or, or maybe not years, but it might be, take a year, might take months and months and months, weeks to build just the foundation. You might not see a lot of high things happening, but maybe they're excavating the ground. Maybe they're preparing the ground. They're tilling the ground. Now they're digging up the ground. Now they're pouring concrete and doing all these things. And you're waiting to see things go up, but they're taking their time on things below. They're taking their time on foundation. Why? Because they know that the higher the skyscraper is going to go, the more stable this foundation needs to be. So my encouragement to you, do not look at someone else's process and get envious of their process because your process doesn't look like their process. God has to prepare your foundation according to your measure of success, according to your purpose, according to the potential that he has in you. So when someone else seems like they're rising high, you know what, God might take a couple years to work on your foundation. Why? Because maybe your building is three times as high as theirs. So your foundation needs to be three times as strong to withstand the weight of your success. We see a lot of people crumble because they can't withstand the weight of success. You know what the weight of success looks like? When I get high up here as a politician and I have to make the right decisions in these closed door meetings where nobody else can see and nobody else is going to hear about. And I got to be willing to stand for integrity, not to make deals under the table and then lie about it. That's, that's what the weight of success looks like. You get somewhere and then what you feel is you'll feel a pressure to make the wrong decision. The pressure to succumb to what peers or whoever your peers may be, what they think you should do. Or the pressure to keep moving up the ladder at the risk of someone else or something else. But that's not you. Why? Because God has prepared you. Why do I know that God has prepared you? Because it's not a coincidence you're up in here. It was by his design. Why? Because the seeds of what's happening this summer needed to be planted into your heart. Because God had somewhere for you to go. He has somewhere for you to go. You, yeah, yeah, you, you too, yeah. All y'all, yeah. Turn your neighbor and say, I got somewhere to go. Turn your other neighbor and say, you got somewhere to go. I have one more scripture to share and then I'll be done. Keep it short. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Some versions say the people cast off restraint, but he who keeps the law happy is he. Still with that first part, though, where there's no vision, the people perish. I like the part that says they cast off restraint. You know what's interesting? You know, people ask me, they'll ask me a general question. They'll say, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge, you know, with our youth today? The deep question. Not y'all, but the other ones. Those, not y'all. Them, them out there. And you know what I say? I say, you know, I think it's a lot of things. But what it roots down to is, first of all, we know everybody just needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. He's the foundation for success. Thank you for that. Amen. Um, but we also know that focus is so key. And you know what I say? I say a lot of these young people who are lost, the focus is off. I can't get to a place of success if I haven't put my focus there first. I don't know a successful person who's been highly successful in their field who just happened to fall on it backwards and didn't know anything about what was happening. Somebody up in that piece was focused. They were focused. They were focused. 
Sometimes it's easy to get sidetracked, girlfriend, boyfriend, relationship this, um, media, social media, Instagram, this music, doing this, doing that, focusing on this hobby over there. It's so easy to put our attention in so many different ways. And you know what I think that does? That dilutes our strength of focus towards his way. I'm not saying that means you have to be super deep spiritual. I'm saying his way is the path that he's carved out for you according to what he's called you to do. Maybe he's called you to be a doctor. Who in here wants to be a a doctor? Okay, so maybe he's called my ladies over here to be a doctor. You know it takes some focus, right? To get there through undergrad, through medical school, you know, you're doing your residency, all those things, even, you know, forming right relationships. It takes focus to get there. You're not often here doing this hobby, often here recording some music over here, um, often here, you know, trying to get famous on YouTube, and then all of a sudden, you know, then you get serious because you're at medical school. That does not happen. Let me tell you, I was looking to get to to the medical field. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a cardiologist. It it took hard work. It took focus. Those people who want to go to medical school and are doctors, I have one of my cousins as a doctor, and I know plenty of physicians. It is a focused path for, for at least a decade of your life. I'm talking about like 15 to 25, you focused. That is your hobby. <laughs> that is your thing. So what am I saying to you? What's your lane? What's your thing? What has God given to you? What is that thing that you're passionate about? I'm not asking you so much as what are you most gifted or most skilled at. That's good, too. But what is that thing that God has called you to? I never desired to be a pastor. Do you know I didn't want to be a pastor? That's crazy. That's crazy. I I never grew up wanting to be a pastor. Like, oh, I'm going to preach. I'm going to wear a three-piece suit. And I'm going to say the thun, the thun, and the hee, hee, And I'm going to do the all thing. I never grew up wanting to do that. I didn't want to be a pastor. But God knew what he had for me. And even in the midst of me thinking I'm pursuing something else, wanted to be a medical doctor, God was still preparing me each step of the way. So some of the stuff I'm going through, I didn't understand how this connects back to me being a doctor. But one day I found out, no, God has this for me. And then everything started to line up. Sometimes it just takes the proper perspective to see it. God has a purpose for each and every one of you, a destiny. Don't let somebody sabotage your future with what they think about you, what they think about your past, maybe past defeats or failures, maybe things that you feel like you don't have necessary. I didn't feel like I could do public speaking. Man, 10 years ago, man, my public speaking skills was terrible, like the struggle for real. It was real. The struggle was real for me. Like, you want me to public speak? Nah, maybe I should fall back and somebody else could do it. But you know what? God took my deficiencies. He took those things that I felt like I was weak in, and he became strong. So every time I speak in front of people, I know it's not me because I know how bad I was by myself. But when I tap into his grace, his anointing, because it's his calling, then the anointing comes on to do what he's called me to do. Don't let anything limit you. Where you came from, your environment, your skill set that you think you do or don't have, uh, education, this, that, what people say, what friends say, what, what culture says. Don't let anything hinder you from pursuing God's purpose for your life. It is the thing that is most fulfilling, knowing that I'm leading people, doing what I love to do, And you all have been so gracious to allow me to continue to do what I love to do. Thank you so much. God bless you.